So Devontae Adams receiving yards, 1,100. Joe, the last time Devontae Adams didn't hit 1,100 receiving yards, he missed a quarter of the season five years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like this number, not just because Devontae Adams is the hub of their offense. I mean, he was that last year, and he only got to 1144 in 17 games. But doing no small part to what I mentioned to Scott Goldbranson earlier when he was on with us, Minshew, if he's the starter for the bulk of the year, showed the ability to pump the football to Michael Pittman in Indy last year. And I have to believe he understands the assignment. And it's the same this year in Vegas, which is pump the football to wide receiver one. The biggest reason to like the over is not only is he a wide receiver one, as talented, almost as talented as any receiver in the game, but he's always available. That's it. It, He's giving you 16, 17. And by the way, if you shop around, you're going to find a a prop of 1,000 yards, 1,000 in in the hook. So you'd much rather have that than playing the 1,100. Uh, Six and a half is the receiving touchdown number. For him, yeah, when he was with the Packers, he would have those blow-up games. And his first season with Vegas, he did. He had 14. He had eight last year. So that one was a little bit closer. Is it going to be tougher with Bowers? I don't know. Now, tip, we can go right into the Bowers conversation because rookie tight ends usually struggle sometimes. Mm-hmm. It Doesn't it feel like that's gone away a little bit in this off these offenses lately? I, I would still tend to say that they struggle, but – is he also going to be a tight end? How are they going to be using him? And then last yeah, season, that's a good point. what we saw out of Sam Laporta, just so impressive, 889 yards, 10 touchdowns. Well, the Bowers touchdown number is four and a half. I, I mean, increasingly, the way tight ends come out of college, they are built to line up just about anywhere in the formation. So, right. and Bowers is a perfect example of that. I wouldn't be surprised if they're lining him up in the backfield sometimes, not necessarily to hand the ball off to him, but, or lining him up in the slot and trying some creative stuff with like jet sweeps. They're going to use it. They used him just about every way they could think to use him his first couple of years at Georgia. That's going to continue, I, I, I think, in Vegas, especially with a guy who, like I said earlier, Likes to get a little, uh, you could call it creative. I'll call it convoluted at times with his offense and Luke Getze. Um, I think that's a possibility. But four and a half receiving touchdowns, I definitely like the over for Bowers. And I, I think I like all the overs on Devontae that you mentioned as well. Six and a half touchdowns. If I can get it as low as 1,000 yards, yeah, absolutely. Bowers, for what it's worth, I don't think he'll win it. But 35 to 1 for Offensive Rookie of the Year, if you think he's going to come in and make a huge splash. Max Crosby is solidly in the defensive player of the year market. You mentioned it a couple minutes ago. Yep. Tied third on the board at FedMGM at 7-1 to one with Nick Bosa and Miles Garrett. Just behind the two uh, co-leaders, Micah Parsons and TJ Watt at plus 550. You mentioned the sack number is set at 13. If he yep. beats that number, he's in the conversation, definitely. I think he's got to do a little bit more and the team's probably got to do a little bit more. Like, a 7-10 and 10 Raiders team and Max Crosby with 15 sacks, probably still not enough for Crosby to have legit defensive player of the year aspirations. You've got to be on a good defense. That's the problem. Yeah. You've got to be on a really good defense, and that's the biggest thing. And you look at Cleveland, look at some of the other teams – Dallas, maybe I think they uh, they take a step back, so I don't expect it to be Parsons. But that's what's always going to hold him back. He's going to have the numbers. I'd rather do something like sack leader with Crosby. But is Wilkins mm-hmm. going to take some of that away? Some of the other guys on that line? Are they going to lift each other up, or, or how's that going to work? Because usually it's a defense where it's one guy getting all the sacks uh, when you have your sack leader. But I would much rather do that than DPOY for him. That's a good call, actually, because you're right. Uh, Look at all the names that have been up there at the top of the board the last couple of years. Bosa, Garrett, Parsons. You mentioned the Cowboys defense probably slides back a little bit this year. I tend to agree with you. Watt, all on defenses that more often than not are better than they are worse, and that hasn't been the case for the Raiders um, the last couple of years. 
they've got a lot of work to do in rebuilding the defensive side of the roster. They did start that to an extent by drafting a couple of corners this year, and they go out and get Tommy Eichenberg late in the draft as well to play in the middle someday. But, yeesh, um, this is a team, you know, much like we talked about with Tennessee yesterday, this is a team that I think is going to get eaten up in the middle of the field and on the back end defensively. Yeah, it's, uh, look, I, I mentioned there are reasons to like Antonio Pierce, and here's what it is. He was a dream to gamblers, a dream. If you caught it early about how hard this team was playing, and then you would see the point spread in some of these matchups where they were getting double digits some of the times, uh, or at least seven plus. If you got a team that's playing hard, like you want to bet on those sorts of situations. Uh, the nine games Pierce was the head coach. They had a five and four record. They were seven, one and one against the spread. Mm. They failed to cover one game under Antonio Pierce. So if you caught that early, like they were competing against everyone. You look at it and say, you, you fire a coach and a GM midseason. It was an unmitigated disaster. Not really. They were a game below 500. They had plus one point differential as far as that goes. They had 10 one-score games. In those 10 one-score games, they went five and five. That's what you're supposed to be. When you're plus one, you're supposed to be around 500. That's where they were. But the quarterback is such a problem. Like, Can you be a 500-team yeah. long-term when one season it, it's uh, Garoppolo and Aiden O'Connell, in O'Connell for 10 of the starts, and now this year it's going to be Minshew and, and maybe Aiden O'Connell, some combination of that. Can you go 500 again with that? Is a talent that strong elsewhere? I'm not going to sit here and say it was a bad move signing Wilkins. Maybe an overpay coming off a career year. You know who else is coming off a career year? Max Crosby. Are we going to see a, a dip in the production with both guys? Or are they going to help each other out playing together? Right. That's the big question. Question Now, with Pierce, it's like, I, I wonder who has more power. Because Pierce was there before Telesco. So mm -hmm. even though he was the interim guy that got the job, who has more power? By their actions, doesn't it look like Pierce has that edge? Because they yeah, didn't I get mean, the, the Max quarterback Crosby, in the Yeah, Yeah, I, I mean, in signing Wilkins, it, it, it all, yeah, it, it definitely looks like this is Antonio Pierce's team. Which, again, to your point about how he got them to perform in the second half of the season, why wouldn't you want it to be his team and just – let Telesco go out and, you know, do his personnel type deal and get final approval from Pierce, maybe. And, and some teams have been successfully built like that. It doesn't have to be the boilerplate GM hands the uh, the head coach the groceries, so to speak, the old Parcells analogy, uh, and then mm -hmm. he's got to make do with whatever he's been handed. It can go the other way around. It, it sounds to me, Joe, and, and I think you're you're spot on about this, it's about how much progression do you get rather than regression. A lot of people are down on the Chargers. They are the second favorite in the division at plus 350. The Raiders are the third favorite at 9-1, to one, Denver 16-1. to one. Do you see that sort of a gap between Denver and Vegas? No. I, well, look, I think Denver's going to be bad. I think there's going to be a lot of growing pains okay. for Bo Nix. So you're um, good with them, them fourth. Is there that sort of a gap between the Chargers with everybody they're getting rid of and these Raiders? They, they, yeah, they, who did tie finish in the tie for second place in the division last year at 8-9, the Raiders did. Raiders so if I just sit here and off the top of my head try to try to peg a number on each team, right? Uh, like a win total number, like Kansas City, 11 and a half, right? Like a, a 11 or 12 win team. Um, and that's probably conservative. Like if they were to get hot again, you could see them winning 13, especially with four against the Raiders and Broncos. Um, and then I look at the Chargers and it's like, okay, that's a 10 win team in my mind. Um, really? Even with, yeah, yeah. Okay. You said it yourself the other day, Justin Herbert, everybody's, you know, I, I, I say it all the time this offseason. I've said it many times. Everybody keeps forgetting that Joe Burrow exists because he didn't play the back third of the season last year. Everybody keeps forgetting Justin Herbert exists. I don't think he's on Burrow's level, but he's a damn good quarterback. And yeah. I understand Williams and Allen aren't there, but how many times did Justin Herbert have to play without Williams and Allen anyway because they were always hurt? So 
Yeah, I, the Chargers winning 10 games is not unrealistic for me. I think there's a two-win spread between Kansas City and the Chargers. And then I think it's probably a two- to three-win spread from the Chargers down to the Raiders. They're a seven-win team, right? And then there's probably another two or three wins down to Denver. So I do think the division is pretty accurately spaced out um, when we look at at odds, other than probably, you know, it's it's a little too close for comfort, I think, between third and fourth in the division between the Raiders and the Broncos. I do think the Raiders are a good two wins better than Denver. The win total is six and a half over or under six and a half. So I, I love the over because I think you look last year, it was about the same. And I think the Raiders looking, I have them about eight wins, right? Um, and, and I think they can do eight games. It all comes down to what that offense does. Right. And I think that if, if the offense is good and the quarterback play is decent. It does not have to be Super Bowl quality, but I do think if they get consistent play out of whoever wins the quarterback job, then to me, I can look down that schedule and say, okay, I think they could do better here. I think there's some teams, I mean, their, their schedule is not easy. It's still difficult, but I do believe that with that and with the offense that they're going to run, yes, it's Luke Getze, but I also think that Antonio Pierce is going to have a strong say there in what they do and be a much more physical team up front. They improve the offensive line on the left side significantly with Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon. So I think they're going to have the opportunity to do that. And so I like the over, not by a lot, you know, seven, eight games. Yeah, I think they win seven or eight games. Do I think they win 10 games? No, I don't. We talk about the two big question marks being Getze quarterback, and on the on the defensive side, the outside cornerback opposite Jack Jones. So to your point about third downs and the ability, or I should say the, the propensity for them to give up big plays on third down, Jack Jones came in like this reclamation project, but he had a personal relationship with Antonio Pierce. So it worked out perfectly for the Raiders. He had the big interception uh, for a touchdown against the Chiefs on Christmas Day. And so they went out, they drafted two young cornerbacks I still think they're going to go out and get another veteran. You look at who's out there. Adoree Jackson, who played for Phil, uh, for um, Graham in New York, is a guy that's still out there, as is Stephon Gilmore. I think they'll still do that. You know those guys don't want to run, and, run around in camp, especially in Las Vegas when it's 115 degrees outside. So I think they'll make that move. But that's certainly a question mark. They have a good young cornerback in Nate Hobbs uh, in the slot. And with Jack Jones there, they have a good set of safety. So I think they can be much better there. I do think they need that veteran presence on the other outside corner to kind of shore that defense up. And then we'll see what happens. Robert Spillane at linebacker obviously did really well, better than I ever thought he could last year with the Raiders. And then they uh, they drafted Tommy Eichenberg out of Ohio State, who I think is kind of the heir apparent there. So he's made some moves. He couldn't do it all at one time. But that cornerback position and whether or not Tyree Wilson in his second year can come along, obviously a first round draft pick as well to be a rotational guy on that edge because he can move inside outside. So that defense, yes. And I think Tom Telesco, his approach in Los Angeles, people were not really excited when the Raiders announced it. And then they looked at his record and said, well, what he was really terrible at was hiring head coaches. And so he's Mm -hmm. not doing that in Las Vegas. And so there's some optimism there, but I think it's cautious.